Welcome and good morning. We're so glad that you are here. Week three of Sounds of Christmas, excited to share with you today. But before we get to that, I got to talk about yesterday. We had a great Christmas party. So many of you came out yesterday and you served. You made it possible and it was cold because the wind was blowing. But we appreciate all of you who served. And then I just want to share kind of some good news from that. So uh, we had, I think, right at like 32 or 3,300 people who actually like followed through with the registration. They were here on our campus and that's awesome. But the thing that we're most excited about is uh, right at about a thousand of those indicated that they have no church home, that they have no church family. So that's pretty remarkable that a third of the people who were here, they don't have a church home. And so uh, maybe you came back today. Maybe you were one of those. Uh, we're glad you're here. Welcome. We hope that you have a great experience and perhaps would consider uh, Vaughn Forest as your church home. But then let me talk to those of us who already call Vaughn Forest home. There's a good chance that over the next few weeks, over the next several months, a lot of those families are going to show up here. They're going to check some things out. And so I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to be looking for them and be welcoming them and letting them know how glad that we are that they are here. But I'm glad you're here today. We've been taking a song each week, talking about the uh, message behind the song, and then more importantly, like how do we apply that? Like how do we take a song that we only sing once a year and find something that's relevant to our lives today? And we just finished singing Away in a Manger. That's one of the first songs you learn about Christmas when you're a kid. And interestingly enough, it's one of the first songs you stop singing when you become an adult, all right? So I wanted us all to sing it today. And y'all did a great job singing that song because I think it captures in song form what it must have been like to be there the night Jesus was born, the nativity scene. I mean, we know all the people in the nativity scene, obviously Mary and Joseph and Jesus, but then there's the shepherds and then there's the wise men. And maybe you have a nativity scene set up in your living room or in your yard. We had one here yesterday with a camel and a donkey and a llama. And I'm not sure if the llama was at the first Christmas, but he was here yesterday, so that was kind of cool. And so uh, you kind of know like what the nativity scene looks like. And what I want to do today in the message is I want to kind of go around and talk about the perspective of each character in the story, not so much their perspective as what their presence teaches us now. See, it's interesting. Jesus is the focus of Christmas, and we know that. But there are other people who are in the story. And anytime you read in the Bible a story, an account, and there are people who are present who, if they weren't present, the main point of the story would still occur. The question is, well, then why is God allowing these individuals to be a part of the story? And there's probably multiple reasons for that question, but one would be perhaps that maybe we could learn something from their lives. And when we really look at the Christmas story, I mean, let's just think about everybody who didn't need to be there. Shepherds don't need to be there. I mean, God can send his son Jesus into the world at the first Christmas without the shepherds, but they're there. Like the wise men don't have to show up. God can still rescue us by sending his son Jesus, and yet the wise men are there. And then if we want to get really technical, I mean, Joseph doesn't really have to be present. So there's all these people who are there, and yet Mary, the mother of Jesus, giving birth to our Savior is really the only part of the story that had to occur. And so why are they there? Well, what I want to do is I want to take each of these characters, and I want to just go through them, and I want to talk about a lesson that I think we can learn from them Today. Now, I'm not the first pastor or preacher to do this, okay? Certainly, this is a pretty common idea to look at the characters, see what are the lessons we can learn from them. And so, not my idea, but these are the lessons that I feel like kind of over the years the Lord has kind of led me to with these characters. But I would also challenge you to discover the lessons uh, for you and your family as well. It's a really fun thing to do as a family during the Christmas season. I mean, we don't have that much time left before Christmas and maybe a couple of evenings before now on Christmas, you just sit around, you get into Luke chapter one, chapter two, Matthew chapter one, Matthew chapter two, talk about some of the characters. Hey, what are some things we can learn from them? So I'm gonna share mine with you today, but I wanna encourage you and maybe with your kids or grandkids to try to look into this and see what other lessons can be learned from the characters. And so in many ways, today's message is gonna feel like five mini sermons, M-I-N-I, not M-A-N-Y, that'd be a lot. All right, so like little mini sermons, and the hope is that like, one of the characters, one of the lessons, one of the things we're going to talk about kind of intersects you with whatever's going on in your life. You walk in here, there's things going on in your life. Maybe one of the lessons will speak exactly to what you are facing. So if you're taking notes today, and I would encourage you to do so, let me give you the first character, Mary. We all know Mary in the Christmas story. Here's the lesson. Choose to be faithful instead 
of fearful. They're all choices, okay? All the lessons are choices today. And I think this is what Mary shows us. That we need to choose to be faithful instead of fearful. Every year at Christmas, I am reminded of just how unbelievable it was that a young teenage girl demonstrated such a remarkable faith. I mean, a remarkable faith. That at any point in the story, like she could have given in to her fear. She could have given in to her anxiety. Instead, she moves forward in faith. I mean, from the beginning, when she finds out she's gonna be the mother of Jesus. Luke chapter one, verses 37 and 38. Here's what Mary says. For no word from God will ever fail. I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her and she moves forward in faith. It's incredible. And isn't it true for us that moving forward in faith is easy to do when circumstances are going well? It's easy to do when our prayers are being answered, but it becomes a lot more challenging to move forward in faith when circumstances aren't going so well, when our prayers aren't being answered, when the fear is very real, when the anxiety starts to creep in, and we start to wonder, how do I keep moving forward? How can I keep going in faith? And sometimes we think that people who move forward in faith, they do so because they don't experience fear. They don't experience anxiety. But, but what I found is that people who move forward in faith, they move forward in the midst of the fear. They move forward in the midst of the anxiety. It's not like they don't have those emotions. It's that they just choose to give more of their time, effort, energies, prayers, thoughts to their faith instead of giving in to their fear. You say, how do you do that? How do you move forward in faith instead of giving in to your fear? And I think Mary gives us the answer in this verse. Mary says, no word from God will ever fail. It's obvious that Mary already had a relationship with God. She, she knew that words from God will not fail. And the way that we move forward in faith is the same. We trust God at his word. And the Bible is full of promises from God's word. And when you're walking through a storm and it's easy to kind of give in to the fear instead of moving forward in faith, the best thing you can do is hang on to the promises of God. Hang on to his word, just like Mary hung on to God's word. And I wanna share a promise with you. It's one you've probably heard before, but maybe somebody here needs to hear it again today. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? That whatever you're walking through today, that God is somehow going to work it for your good. You say, when's that going to happen? I don't know. You say, is it going to get harder before it gets better? Probably. But the idea is that moving forward in faith is we take God at his word. And here's what we say, God, I trust you. That sometimes the greatest gift we can give God, sometimes the greatest expression of worship to God is our trust. That even when we can't see, we keep moving forward in faith. We don't give in to our fear. We don't give in to our anxiety. And Mary shows us that time after time, year after year, when we get to the Christmas story. We move forward in faith. We don't give in to our fear. Let me give you the second character, Joseph. What does Joseph show us? Choose to take responsibility instead of blaming others. Good lesson. As soon as Joseph finds out Mary's pregnant, his first inclination is to blame her for what's occurred, okay? So Mary comes to Joseph and she says, hey, I'm pregnant and um, it's God's baby. God's the father. That's a really tough sell, all right? So Joseph is kind of like, really? So the Bible says because Joseph was kind, he was gonna send Mary away quietly. He, he did not wanna bring destruction into her life, but he's blaming her for the circumstance that they are now in. But an angel shows up to clarify with Joseph that this is in fact True, Matthew 1, verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. Here's something I think we miss in the story. How easy then would it have been for Joseph to blame God? I mean, once God sent an angel to him to tell him this was true, he's not blaming Mary anymore, but like he could have been resentful and bitter towards God. It's like, God, this did not show up in our premarital counseling. Like this was not part of the plan, right? Like he could have totally turned on God and yet he didn't. 
And what I found is that for many of us, when we find ourselves in a situation we did not choose, in a circumstance that we had nothing to do with, but yet here we are, it's easy for those of us who are followers of Jesus, if we're not careful, to begin to blame God. Say, God, if you really want what's best for me, how could you let this happen? I mean, God, if you love me so much, why would you let this occur? And immediately we start trying to blame. And to make matters worse, we live in a culture that tells us anytime something happens to us, deflect it. Anytime something happens to us, find someone to blame. Find someone that we can put the blame at and, and don't take responsibility for it. And yet here's what Joseph shows us. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you might as well seize it because it ain't going to go away. Like you might as well step into it. You might as well take responsibility for it, even if you didn't choose it. Some of you are here today, you're in a situation with your family. You did not choose, and yet all of the consequences are falling at your feet. Some of you are here today, and, and with your career, you are in a situation that you had nothing to do with. Maybe you were laid off. Maybe you were fired. Maybe somebody lied about you. Maybe all of these things happened to you, and it has affected your livelihood. Maybe you're here this morning and it's something with your marriage. Maybe it's with parenting. Maybe it's with one of your adult kids and, and they've kind of wandered off and you thought this was going to be a season of blessing. It ain't a season of blessing. Like it's just all the stuff you're having to deal with. And, and literally I could go on and on. Maybe, maybe you've had to move here recently. You got transferred here. Maybe you, you, know, you had to come here. Maybe you're part of our, our military. We appreciate your service. But like truth be told, in a moment of honesty, you don't really want to live here. Okay? So all of us can name something happening in our lives. And listen, I, let's just be honest. Like, there are things that happen sometimes that we don't have anything to do with. And yet, we got to deal with it. What are we supposed to do? Joseph shows us. Take responsibility. Step up. Own it. This is your reality, whether you chose it or not, Joseph. And this is your reality, whether you chose it or not. And the moment you take responsibility for it, is the moment you can begin to do something about it. You say, well, how do you do that? Like, how do you take responsibility for something you don't want to be in, for something you didn't choose, and move forward in a way where it actually starts to get better? That's a pretty good question with probably lots of different things we could discuss. But foundationally, let me tell you a good place to start, that the way you move forward is you start believing what God says about you. That God saw enough in Joseph to deliver this message to him, and then pulled for Joseph all along the way, knowing Joseph would come through. That God was for Joseph, and God is for you. And here's an amazing verse that I think shows us what God says can happen in our lives when we take responsibility for things. Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What a phrase, more than conquerors. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus. The Bible says you're part of a royal priesthood. The Bible says you're a son or a daughter of the king. And here's what God says is for you. And God says in any situation you're in, when I'm with you, you and me are in the majority. And here's what God says about you. You're not just going to survive. You're not just going to get by. You're not even just going to conquer this. You're going to be more than a conqueror. That's what God thinks about you this morning. So whatever you're in this morning, instead of blaming, instead of, you know, continuing to maybe try to, uh, you know, deal with the pain or the anguish or whatever, like you just lean into it. You step into it. You say, God, you're still sovereign. God, I still trust you. And I'm going to move forward with you, believing that I can be more than a conqueror. It's powerful that we see this from Joseph. Let me give you the next characters. Okay, let's move. Moving along. We've got five of them we've got to cover. The shepherds. What do the shepherds tell us? Choose to tell my story instead of focusing on on what I don't know. I love the shepherds in the story. I love that the angels came to the shepherds. The angels didn't show up to like all of the church officials, all of the people who had been educated. They showed up to shepherds. And listen, like when you were in high school at career day, you did not say, I want to be a shepherd. These guys did not dream of growing up to be shepherds. Shepherds are what you became when everybody else passed you by. This was like an apprentice society. So, you know, you would get a, a mentor apprentice where somebody would show you a, a trade. That's why most of the disciples were fishermen, okay? Their fathers were fishermen. Shepherds were just left to be shepherds. These are kind of the guys that everybody shunned and everyone avoided. And yet, the announcement of Jesus' birth is announced to the shepherds. It's incredible. And then I love what they do. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 17, 18. Don't you want to hang out with the shepherds when we get to heaven one day? I'm just going to serve. That's awesome. Just, just to listen to these guys. And they may even have like some good southern, almost kind of like redneck accents. That's how I think of when I think of the southern. Good old country boys, all right? And only the positive sense. That could be a negative sense. I am chasing a rabbit. All right, Luke chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Look what the shepherds do. When they had seen him, Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. And what the shepherds said to them, they were amazed for two reasons. One, at what had happened. Two, at who was telling them. They're like, aren't these the shepherds? Like, yes, these are the shepherds. And here's what the shepherds are doing. They're telling everyone about their encounter with Jesus. Here's the thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have a story to tell, just like the shepherds. And here's what the shepherds did not do. This is what you will not find in the Bible. It does not say that upon going and seeing Jesus, that they went down to the local church and signed up for a 12-week Bible course. That is not in there. They did not find a discipleship group. They did not find someone who could mentor them one-on-one. -on -one. Now, look, I'm not against any of those things. All of those things are fine. But, hey, church, can we just be reminded for a second that sometimes we have to remember that the point of all of those things is to help us continue to share our story. And sometimes those of us who become followers of Jesus, or maybe you're new to faith, and you think, I, you know, I just don't know. I mean, if I tell people about what's happened in my life, like they may ask me a question about the Bible. I don't know. Let me put that fear at ease. They will ask you a question about the Bible you don't know. And here's the answer. I don't know. That's all you have to say, okay? It's incredible. It's very freeing. My, I have to do this about three times a week at dinner with my kids. They'll ask me a question about the Bible. I'm like, I don't know. Eat your dinner, All right. So that's how that goes, okay? People are going to ask you things you do not know, but you still have a, to a story that you can share, a story that you can tell. And your story of life change is powerful. Do you know how the church grew most rapidly in the history of the church? It was in the first century. And they weren't toting around their Bibles on their way to Sunday school. The New Testament hadn't even put together yet. They're just sharing their story of what happened when they experienced salvation in Jesus Christ. It's powerful. So here's my question for you this morning. Do you know your story? Can you articulate your story? I mean, could you say, like, th this is what was going on in my life before I met Jesus. And these were the circumstances that led me to coming to a place where I accepted him. As my Savior, I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he defeated death through the resurrection. I accepted him as my Savior. I'm promised eternity with him and heaven forever, purpose on my, with my life here on earth for now. And, and then, like, here's what's happened since then. Like, I haven't always gotten it right. In fact, there's a lot of things that I still, you know, mis make mistakes every day, but Jesus is still faithful, and Jesus is still present, and he's provided me with other people who encourage me and support me in my walk. Like, can you share your story? And I would encourage you, like, if you can't articulate your story, to figure out how to do that because nobody can take your story from you. And nobody can argue about your story. It's your story, how Jesus has changed your life. And then let me just say this at Christmas, okay? I'm not saying this because I'm trying to be judgmental or offend anybody or sound overly preachy or anything like that. I'm saying this because I care about you. If you can't think of your story, if you don't have a story that comes to mind, it might be that your faith has been founded more on a sentiment than your personal story. See, your family story doesn't count. Growing up in a Christian home is not part of your story. Being a part of a great church is not part of your story. There are people who sit in churches every single Sunday in every single town in our country who don't have a story. And so if you don't have a story, it might be time to clarify that this Christmas and come to a place where you, for yourself, on your own, not because of your family, not because of your upbringing, not because of a great church you attend, but because of you. You come to a place where you confess and ask Jesus to be your Savior. See, we all should have a story that we're quick to share, just like the shepherds. And, and, and learn all the information later. Take all the classes. Study all you can so that you can communicate your story more as you get through different seasons of your life. The shepherds have so much to tell us in the Christmas story. Let me give you the next characters, the wise men, okay? What do the wise men show us? Choose to keep seeking instead of settling for simplicity. The wise men were seekers. Simple answers were not enough for the wise men. Th these guys were like the first mystics. 
And they looked around at the world and all of the darkness that was in the world at that time, all of the violence that was in the world at the time, all of the problems that were in the world at the time. And they said, there's got to be more than just what we can see. There's got to be something beyond our present reality. Now, they weren't sure what that was, but they were seeking to find what that was. And in many ways, these guys were kind of like the first astrologers and astronomers. They thought they could find their answers through studying the stars. And isn't it interesting that God met them in the avenue that they were seeking him through? Now, they didn't know this is what they were seeking for. But God says, I'll show you a star. This is the way they're seeking. They're open, and God uses a star to lead them to the ultimate answer, the ultimate truth, his son, Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And they did, and they worshiped Jesus. And maybe you're here today, and this whole idea of Jesus, it just seems a little far-fetched. Maybe you know someone, and, and they say things like that. But maybe you're here. Maybe you're checking things out. And yeah, you know, the Christmas season, it's fun. It's, it's a nice, joyous time of year. But the idea that like God would come to earth by sending his son, who is both fully God and fully man, who would live a perfect life and die on a cross for the sins of the world, defeat death through the resurrection three days later, ascend into heaven with the promise that he's going to return, like that just all seems a little far-fetched. And maybe like the idea that there are 7 billion people who are on the planet and there are multiple religions and there are multiple cultures, this idea that Jesus is the only way to God, that just seems a little narrow-minded. And listen, if you're here today and that's how you feel about things, here's my challenge to you. Stay open-minded. Keep seeking. I've been surprised so many times over the years to encounter individuals who would consider themselves to be very open-minded, but yet they're very closed off when it comes to matters of faith. They're open-minded about everything else, but it's like they've already decided what they think about things concerning faith. And I would challenge you to remain open, to intellectually continue to study, to, to not throw up a wall and say, no, I, I just can't have a part of that. Because, see, if you keep seeking, just like the wise men, I believe that you'll ultimately be led to the truth. Listen, maybe, church, you have a, a friend or a family member who's like that, and maybe you have a child that's like that. They're constantly asking questions. They express their doubt, and it kind of makes you a little nervous. And what I would encourage you to do when you, with your friends, with your family members, is encourage them to keep seeking. Sometimes, church, in an effort to, like, kind of, you know, give some answers, we can take like a verse out of context and, and like make things a little too simplistic. Let's not do that. Like when someone has questions about the deep issues, the deep matters, like let's not take one little verse and kind of throw it at it and make, act like that makes everything okay. Let's encourage folks to keep digging, keep exploring, keep seeking just like the wise men. I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis. I mean, C.S. Lewis who wrote, you know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Chronicles of Narnia, Mere Christianity, The Problem with Pain, Screw Tape Letters, all of these amazing books that some of them got turned into movies that have encouraged so many people in their faith. And yet C.S. Lewis started off as an atheist. And he was an atheist, and he reached the conclusion intellectually that faith in Jesus Christ was the only thing that made sense. And, and we, we could talk about a lot of things that C.S. Lewis said. My favorite quote from C.S. Lewis it was when he talked about Jesus not being a good teacher. And you're gonna see that a lot during the Christmas season. I mean, you probably flip on the History Channel tonight. Somebody will say something about Jesus, good moral teacher, someone we can learn a lot of things from. And C.S. Lewis says, no, Jesus was not a good teacher. Like, good teachers don't tell people to do the things Jesus said. He can't just be a good teacher. C.S. Lewis says, Jesus is either a liar, either he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Like, either he's a liar, like he's the biggest con artist in the history of mankind, he's a lunatic, he's crazy, he thought he was the son of God, or he's who he said he was. And C.S. Lewis, I believe, rightly concluded Jesus Christ was who he said he was. He placed his faith in him. I'm reminded of Lee Strobel, the author of The Case for Christ. If you've never read The Case for Christ, I would encourage you to read it. I think they made a movie about this. I have not seen the movie yet, but about his his discovery, he started off as an atheist. Someone challenged him with the evidence, as one other author has said, the evidence that demands a verdict. There's all this evidence about the person of Jesus Christ, and he studied it, and he reached the conclusion that he could place his faith in Jesus Christ from the evidence 
that he discovered. I'm reminded of Dr. Gary Habermas, who is the world-renowned expert on the resurrection. He writes one of the chapters in the case for Christ. And I had the privilege of sitting under Dr. Habermas's teaching when I was in graduate school. And, and Dr. Habermas lays out this really compelling case that we have more evidence for the resurrection than some of the other things that we've always assumed are actually factual. You say, what do you mean? Well, like Paul's letters in the New Testament, like for example, 1 Corinthians, we'll just choose one of the letters. We have thousands of copies of this, of this letter because that's how it got distributed to churches in the first century. And like, it can be dated by archaeologists who know what they're doing, like back to the first century. Not like a Sunday school teacher dating it back to the first century, like somebody who does this for a living. And they're like, yeah, this was from the first century. And we've got thousands of copies of these letters that talk about what Paul says about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, and it's interesting, like from history, we know of a guy named Alexander the Great, which is an awesome nickname, right? Not Alexander the Mediocre, no, Alexander the Great, right? I think he gave himself that name. And I don't question the existence of Alexander the Great, but when you compare it to Jesus, the, the, the closest documents we have concerning Alexander the Great's life were written 400 years after he was alive. And we have documents written about Jesus less than 40 years after he was alive, and we have thousands of copies. And so, like, I don't have a, enough faith to just believe Alexander the Great lived, but, but not believe that Jesus lived because there's more evidence for Jesus' life. Now, you know, all things being told, I believe both people existed. And so the, the, what I'm trying to say is it's not a question, like, let's just, you know, we'll move away from the Bible for a second. It's not a question scientifically based on like what's been proven by archaeologists, whether or not there was a man who walked around on earth named Jesus who claimed to be the Son of God, and then there were people, over 500 of them, who said, we saw him dead and then we saw him alive again. It's not a question whether or not these events really happened. The question is, what will we do with this? And so if you have someone and they're continuing to seek and they're continuing to, you, you keep challenging them. You keep encouraging them to keep seeking because there's more evidence for what we hold to in our faith than any other belief system on the planet. And someone who keeps seeking, I really believe that Jesus will show them that he is the truth. Let me give you the last character that we can learn from, King Herod. He's kind of the antithesis of all the other characters. But here's the lesson. Choose to accept the Savior instead of reject the Savior. He's the only person in the Christmas story who rejected Jesus as the newborn king. And Herod was not a good person. And yet, Herod had the same opportunity just like everyone else. And it's a reminder that you don't have to be a good person to come to faith in Jesus Christ. The same opportunity was made available to Herod as everyone else. Herod even had all of the details. Matthew chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 tells us this. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him. The prophecies from Isaiah say Bethlehem. Herod knew where Jesus was going to be born. Herod knew people who were on their way to visit the newborn king. And yet he chose to reject Jesus. Herod viewed himself as the king, and Jesus being born as a new king was a threat to him. And we say, well, you know, that makes sense. Like, he is the king of a literal kingdom, and this new king is somehow going to be a threat to him. But at the end of the day, what's driving Herod's lack of belief, what's driving Herod to reject Jesus as a savior is his pride. It's his pride. And we may not be kings of literal kingdoms, but make no mistake about it, all of us, every person who has ever walked the planet, we feel like the kings of our own little kingdoms, our own lives. And we don't, any, we don't want anyone telling us what to do with our lives. And you know what's behind that? Pride. Pride. It's the exact same sin that drove Herod to reject Jesus as his Savior. And it's the exact same sin that continues to drive people to reject Jesus as their Savior. Listen, if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I just lovingly like, share a few things with you because I care about you? It's not because you haven't met other people whose lives have been changed by Jesus. It's not because 
you just can't buy into all the stuff in the Bible. I mean, I could give you all the research and send you to the library. You could read for the next week. It's all there, but let me save you some time. It's there, okay? It's not because there's not enough evidence. The reason why you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ is because of your pride. It takes great humility to accept, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It takes great humility to come to a place where you recognize that despite the fact that for your whole life, everyone has told you, our culture has told you, teachers have told you, our world has told you, everybody's told you that you can find the answer from within. You have to get to a place of humility where you say, I've looked and all I keep finding is heartache, pain, and regret. If I'm supposed to find the answer inside myself, this isn't working. And the reason why it's not working is because you were never designed to find the answer inside yourself, which is why Jesus came at Christmas. The answer is outside of you. His name is Jesus. That takes great humility to acknowledge that. It takes great humility to then acknowledge that Jesus had to actually die, not just for the sins of the world, but for your sins, for my sins. That takes great humility. It takes great humility then to ask him to come into your life and be your savior and not just your savior, your Lord. It takes great humility to say, my life no longer belongs to me. I've gone far enough doing it my way. I'm gonna now repent and let the Lord lead my life and I'm gonna do things his way. It takes great humility. And the biggest stumbling block to someone coming to faith in Jesus Christ is pride. It has always been and it will always be. And here's why that's so devastating. Here's why that's so illogical, if I could even use that word this morning. Because see, Paul, the same guy who gave us all the evidence that Jesus was resurrected, he wrote another letter. And, and, and in this letter to the church in a place called Philippi, he said that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So here, here's why all of this, and this is what drives me to be bold in telling you what I'm telling you this morning. Every person who has ever lived will bow the knee and confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. It is not a question of whether or not you will get to a place in your life where you have to confess Christ Jesus is Lord. That day will occur. The question is whether or not you will do it in this lifetime. When you can choose to do it, experience salvation, and be promised eternity with God in heaven forever, or whether you will continue to go through this life prideful, doing things your own way, ultimately getting to a place one day after you die where you have to bow, confess that Christ Jesus is Lord, and then that be the last thing you do before spending an eternity separated from him in a place the Bible calls hell. That haunts me, that people will experience that, that that will be the reality for people who continue to reject Jesus even though they had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to accept him. It's devastating. And so I wanna challenge you, if you're here this morning and Christmas is just a season you go through, church is just something you do because it's what you do, but faith in Jesus Christ is something that you've just never gotten to a place where you wanna make that decision and you think I gotta get my act cleaned up or you think I, there's a bunch of things I've gotta get taken care of first. You come to Jesus just as I am, the old hymn says. You come to Jesus just like you are, and you, in humility, confess him as your Savior. Would you bow your heads together with me this morning? Maybe that's you. I've asked everybody to bow their heads, so nobody's looking around. That's just you. You're sitting here, and you're like, I've never come to that place where I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. It's not so much like the words that you say as it is the condition of your heart, but can I just challenge you right where you're seated this morning to just say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. I want to ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. I confess that you died for my sins. You defeated death through the resurrection. And I believe that you and you alone can save me. And I want to make you my Lord. That my life is no longer about me. There's no better decision than you could ever make than to get started with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and that's a decision that you've made before, but truthfully, you're in the midst of some circumstances you didn't choose, and it's tough, and it's difficult. And maybe this morning you need to be reminded that God says you're more than a conqueror. Maybe you need to be reminded again this morning that Jesus says he's walking with you. You're not facing this alone. And so, Lord, I'm asking during this time of response as we sing and worship that, Lord, you would be present in this room, that you would be speaking to us, that you would be encouraging us 
Lord, you know what each person in this room needs. And my prayer is that during these next few moments that each person in this room would experience that from you. Lord, we're grateful that you came after us at Christmas. We're grateful that you saw it through to the cross. We're grateful that we don't have to fear death because of the resurrection. But Lord, some of us, we just kind of need that nudge to kind of keep going today. So Lord, maybe during these next few moments, we could just experience that from you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Hey, I'm gonna invite you to stand. And as you stand, we're gonna respond and worship together.